Excellent. Yeah, Thank you very go. much. Okay, good morning, Smookon. Uh, so, actually, this is my first time uh, to Shmoo, uh, no, apart from a lot of people haranguing me for uh, years to come. So, I'm going to uh, talk about a whole bunch of things I've been doing uh, with uh, hardware and to give you a kind of idea of how to attack things, how to secure things, and things that you can actually do uh, that generally you have a mental block on and it's like, no, nope, you can probably just do it. So, oh, it would be useful if I turn my presenter on. Okay, so, <clears throat> a lot of hardware is designed not with security in mind. So there's a whole bunch of things that happens in uh, hardware design that uh, basically will absolutely, uh, you know, it will be great for the hardware designers, it will be great to debug, it's, it's also great for hackers and, and therefore not very secure. So uh, Franklin Systems, hardware security startup, uh, we're boutique, so there are lots of people that claim to do hardware security, uh, and they're really software pen test companies, and the hardware is just them trying to pad out their offering and you know, give a full service. But actually, when it comes down to it, there's only a handful of companies worldwide that actually properly dive into hardware security. Uh, so we also so we penetrate pen test embedded systems and look at everything. So my job tends to be quite interesting because it could be a car one day, it could be a credit card terminal, it could be an access control system. Everything's different and even if it's the same type of device, when you get under the hood, everything's different. Uh, and we also uh, provide consultancy on uh, new design. Ideally, and this happens a lot, hopefully before you've actually started uh, designing them, uh, because basically once the hardware is, uh, you know, once the hardware design's done, quite often it's kind of set in stone and very hard for the manufacturers to change. And they generally don't want to do it at that point. And we also advise on uh, standards for hardware security, there's a, there's a whole bunch of them out there. They're getting better. They used to be a bit crap, and now people are actually uh, thinking about it. So, hardware hacking 101. The way I address things is the first thing I want to know is about the device. Quite often, uh, manufacturers are a bit uh, reticent to provide things like circuit diagrams, but the bottom line is, as soon as I have that device in my hand, I've essentially got the circuit diagram. The next thing I want to know is, where is the non-volatile memory on the device? Uh, where are you likely to store stuff that I might want to exploit? And also, how is the data flowing between the various components on the board? Uh, is it secured? Can it be man in the middle? What data is flowing across those links? And generally, what you'll find is internally in the within the board, they don't tend to think about inter-component uh, security. So quite often, you'll find uh, you know, data from a, a microcontroller uh, going to a Wi-Fi chip the Wi-Fi chip will be handling all the Wi-Fi protocol and maybe doing HTTPS from there to the endpoint, but the data quite often could be going to that Wi-Fi chip in plain text, so an intercept point there. Also, how have they secured the microcontrollers? Uh, all microcontrollers generally can be locked, uh, and they tend to be locked to prevent you reading out the firmware. They can almost always be reprogrammed because that's a big fear of device manufacturers is they push an update or they've you know, blown firmware onto the chips at manufacturing 
and they've bricked a whole bunch of devices. So at a hardware level, you can almost always plug in a hardware programmer and reflash the chip. Uh, and that means that if you can get the firmware off the chip in the first place, uh, you can then patch it and re-blow it on and essentially weaponize the device. Also, what type of chips are they using? Uh, if you're trying to protect things like keys, there are hardware devices that are very good at protecting keys. Microcontrollers are not those devices. So what you'll find is they won't have really considered that. They'll have put all their secrets. Uh, so many years ago, uh, HID, I-Class access control readers, the master key is in the reader and they were using a PIC, I think a PIC24 chip to store that master key. Uh, they are secure uh, from common or garden man just trying to read the data out if the chip is locked. However, there are lots of outfits. I use a, a bunch in China uh, and I sent the, the chip off, paid them 900 bucks and they sent me the, the image. Uh, and I've had chips, uh, I've had the code ripped out of chips by this un unit for as little as 90 bucks. So yeah, uh, hacking as a service or firmware extraction as a service, it is, it is possible to do yourself uh, depending on the device, but uh, actually 900 bucks, okay, you know, I'm passing that on to the client, there we go. And actually, one of the things I do use, uh, you know, ask them a lot of questions, is depending on how secure the chip is, that price is sliding. Uh, so I'll ask them if I have a client that's proposing a particular chip, I'll ask them, so I'm, I have one of these, how much is it gonna cost to get the, the firmware out? And, uh, you know, getting a cheaper, expensive answer from them basically says, right, here's your risk. Uh, you know, anyone with 100 bucks is gonna get your firmware and your keys because you're not securing them. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe you ought to think about uh, another microcontroller. And also how old. So as chips progress, older chips tend to have crappier security. So, uh, you know, from the same variant of a uh, single chip with the different variants as they progress, if they're older uh, variants, they tend to have vulnerabilities. So the other thing I want to know is all your secrets. I want to know everything about that device. I want all the firmware, I want all the non-volatile memory, because at that point, you've no place to hide from me. If I have all that data, you're screwed, simple as. So, the other thing that's kind of unique uh, about Franken systems is we're not deterred about limitations. We'll get to a point and it's like, oh, in order to do this, uh, yeah, we'd need this very expensive piece of gear. Fuck that, we'll just make it ourselves. So if it tool doesn't exist, build it. So I'll take you through some examples. Uh, this first one is quite interesting because it spawned a whole bunch of, of tech just from me basically saying to my dentist, hey, if I bring some shit in, will you x-ray it for me? <laughs> right? My dentist is cool as fuck, right? And he was <laughs> absolutely into it. <coughs> so. So here's, here's one of the first uh, x-rays uh, that I took, or he took for me. And there's actually, so there's a few uh, devices here and there's also a board. But the level of detail, because it's a dental x-ray, it's, you know, they want to see very fine detail like nerves and things like that inside the teeth. So just using film, that is good enough to spot bond wires inside the chip. Uh, the, the, this pin here, the one that has, I think, three or four, uh, three bond wires to it, 
The reason it's got three and the others just have one is uh, that's the ground rail. So it's power supply. So therefore, we're throwing extra bond wires in to handle the current. So on the board, uh, there is a particular chip kind of just sitting here in the middle. Uh, and I pulled it off because I noticed something interesting about it, which is a bit unusual. So that was kind of the device. And under X-ray, this is what it looked like. And actually, it's three chips in one. So we have a radio transmitter here, a microcontroller, and a, an EEPROM memory. And one of the interesting things was, holy shit, the EEPROM is directly connected to the microcontroller inside the package. Uh, and that means that it's, uh, again, a potential target to intercept. But the trick is, how do I access those bond wires, keeping the chip intact, uh, and just allowing me to probe onto those wires? So there is a machine for that. Uh, it costs about 22 and a half grand, uh, and definitely out of budget for this project. So uh, I thought, well, I know what you're doing. I think I can pull that off. So thus was born the decapinator, <laughs> which uh, when people ask me how to describe it, I'm like, in short, it's a boiling nitric acid fountain, right? <laughs> so uh, you have a flask in here, and actually this was my original design, and as I kind of iterated it, I got rid of lots and lots of variables. So that syringe there was replaced by an air pump, initially with, an air, with a valve, so I could adjust the airflow, and then later I'm like, I'm trying to get rid of variables. I don't want to work out you know, where that valve should be set at, so I'm just putting it on max. Uh, and again, the uh, acid is sitting on a hot plate. It's not quite boiling. Boiling for nitric acid is about 120 Celsius. Uh, boiling for water, of course, is 100 Celsius. And I don't really want anything. I want everything really hot, but actually boiling is probably not a great idea. So the bath is set at 90. And then your only other variable is time. So, uh, and it turns out that that's all you need and it's super repeatable. So I created a, so it's the acid is jetting up and it's going through a mask that basically uh, just allows me to hit the bit of the chip I want and all the material that's being etched off falls downwards under gravity and gets washed out into the, uh, the drain beaker. So there's an example of the mask. This is my, uh, this is my very first go. Uh, so random little microcontroller, that took about uh, four minutes. Uh, now, the first time I did my target chip, four minutes is way fucking too long. Right, so I, it almost went through the whole thing. Uh, so, but when I dialed it in, as it turns out, a minute and a half is just right. And a minute and a half, every time, will give you a picture that's like that. So it's just exposing the bond wires, the top of the bond wires, as they form that little arc. <coughs> and, uh, Again, eBay is your friend, so we bought a probe scope uh, from eBay for probing uh, semiconductors. We use it in semiconductor testing, and we were able to put micro probes onto that and intercept the data flow between the microcontroller and, and the EEPROM. Again, I want to know your secrets. So the microcontroller was very interesting. In this case, it used a thing called masked ROM. So mask ROM is basically 
the program structure itself is baked into the hardware. So once that chip has been manufactured, you can't change anything. It's like bricking a slogan in different colored bricks into a wall. It's there, it's not going anywhere. So this uh, uses mass ROM, uh, so the program can never be changed. But when we actually started looking into it, when I spoke to my uh, guys in China and said, right, we've got mass ROM, how much will it take? And they're like, yes, that, that's not possible. I'm like, okay, well, I'm having a look at this data. It kind of looks possible to me when you start to get closer. Oh, well, that looks like, like bits to me. And of course it is bits. Uh, you either have uh, a layer connecting uh, down or you don't. And my colleague at the time, I produced a set of stitched together images and he wrote a piece of software that would basically OCR. So it would literally, you'd do some manual alignment to say, right, this is a row, there's my verticals, there's a gap every this much, go for it. And th the way this is actually structured is uh, every other bit is part of that same uh, character. So you've got data lines coming off the top, but also you've got data lines for every other bit coming off the bottom. Uh, and we were able to, you know, from that one project, from that one x-ray at the dentist, uh, the decapinator was formed, the data was extracted from the EEPROM, the mass ROM uh, data was extracted, and in fact, the dev kit for this microcontroller, which is a little four-bit microcontroller, it's quite old, the, uh, the dev kit for that, which was like a couple of hundred bucks, because it's so old and so rare, the only dev kits we could find were like 25 grand. Uh, and annoyingly, we bumped into someone who literally said, oh shit, yeah, I just came across one of those. I was clearing my basement out two weeks ago. It went in the skip. And I'm like, well, thanks. But in order to fix that, a uh, 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 decompiler was written and a CPU emula emulator was written for this little four-bit CPU, and we were able to, to deal with the code that way. So uh, here's a, another example of kind of doing stuff yourself. Uh, so one of the things I always want to do is if I have a PCB in my hand, ideally I want to be able to get the copper layers off and work out, derive the circuit diagram from the PCB. If I've got it, I've got the circuit diagram. It's just not in a particularly convenient format. So uh, you can go through it by hand. It's totally doable. It's a huge pain in the arse. Uh, Acupuncture needles are a very useful thing because acupuncture needles are thin enough to, to pass through vias that connect top to bottom layers or top to middle layers. So rather than flipping the board back and forth and going, is that the hole? Uh, you just pop an acupuncture needle through and flip it over and, and there it is. Uh, it works a treat. But ideally I, I wanted to be able to to reverse engineer that in a kind of easy and less painful way. So also to have a, have a look and maybe spot things in something that maybe shouldn't be there or, or things that possibly I was missing. So on, on multi-layer boards, uh, if they're very high end these days, sometimes they embed components inside internal layers of the board, which is mind blowing, but they do it. So. Uh, is there something in there that I'm, I'm completely missing? So the gold standard for that is uh, a CT scanner. In fact, a micro CT scanner, and they're awesome. Uh, I have a fantastic client, uh, and they were like, so we've got some extra budget money left over. Can you think of any tools that could, could make your job easier? I'm like, Oh, yes, I can. <laughs> uh, and I'm like, yeah, do you want to give us a, a list um, and we'll see what we can do? 
I'm like, can you give me a price guide? <laughs> no, 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 just, just whatever. Number one on the list, micro CT scanner, 150 grand. Of course, of course I didn't get it, but I did get a bunch of other toys, so that was quite cool. Uh, but it is expensive. I have thought about using a service, but uh, again, I don't really want to, uh, simply because some of the stuff I, I look at is quite sensitive. So, using the adage, if you don't have the tool, build it yourself. So, before I go on to it, I, I'm going to uh, talk a little about CT scanner internals. And as I don't have a laptop audio hookup, I'm going to chuck this down here. Uh, so, a couple of things you should know about dealing with, with proper big CT scanners is, number one, put on your brown rubber safety pants because they are uh, interesting bits of kit and uh, possibly slightly more dangerous than you could possibly believe. Uh, so basically, uh, it's a 2,000 pound spinning maw of death that's shooting x-rays. <coughs> uh, so, yeah, so when people say, oh, the CT, it, it, it might be a little bit noisy, it's like, that's, that's what's happening under that nice plastic cover. <laughs> <coughs> It's uh, it's about 800 kilograms, so about 2,000 pounds, and it is being held in perfect balance. Uh, unlike your car wheels, you definitely don't want that fucker getting a bit wobbly. <laughs> so, so what's happening under the hood? So basically, you have an X-ray source, uh, and it's a point source. So just think of a pinhead, and it's shooting X-rays out and it's forming a cone, just like a flashlight. Uh, if you think about X-raying things, that cylinder in the middle, if you imagine that cylinder as being semi-transparent, uh, so imagine shooting a flashlight through something like a, a bottle of water or a glass like this uh, onto a detector. So this is going to grab a full image and uh, big CT scanners uh, work in different ways now. So now, nowadays you have what's known as a helical CT scan, which is basically just using a slightly different algorithm and it just works a little bit faster. But basically that's going to rotate. It's going to take a, a series of images and uh, then uh, you deal with those images uh, and do a little bit of processing. So, here's my version. So, unlike the uh, unlike the big one, this is really small. It's using uh, a, a dental X-ray sensor. So, if I go a little bit closer. So, on the right. You have a dental interoral uh, X-ray sensor. It is uh, designed to replace film, so they they put a bag over it and shove it in your mouth when they're taking X-rays. Uh, the orange thing in the middle is is my actual target, and it's a high security device uh, for uh, intrusion detection system. And then there's my uh, X-ray source. So uh, all in all. The X-ray source was about 330 quid from eBay. The sensor I, I got from Bodo Man at DEF CON a few years ago for 400 bucks. Even used, they're a little bit on the pricey side, uh, but you can occasionally get cheap ones. Uh, there's a couple of different sizes. This is a size two, which means it's slightly bigger. And uh, basically, the, the rest of the rig is a stepper motor to rotate the sample. So unlike the one you just saw, instead of uh, 
the sensor package and X-ray source rotating around you. I'm rotating this around and everything else is static. Uh, it's controlled by a Raspberry Pi and a, uh, an open source CNC board. Uh, so once that's dialed in, uh, you just send it G-code commands and uh, it works like a charm. Uh, the X-ray is fired with a, a little remote control and that remote control is actually connected to uh, a couple of pins on that uh, CNC controller for controlling coolant flow. So you send an M8 and an M9 and it turns the coolant on and off and that uh, takes, a, takes an X-ray, fires an X-ray. So you let it cook, so it's obviously not quite, the first time I ever got a CT scan, I was like, holy shit, that was actually quite fast. This is not quite fast. Uh, so depending on how many images you take, uh, there's about a 40 second, uh, so I can actually do it a lot faster, but then the X-ray sensor overheats. So it's about 40 seconds a snap to take you know, a one second exposure uh, download the data and have it have the data converted relatively slowly within the the Pi, but that's fine because as I said, I tried to go fast, and I would, you know, get X number of images and the sensor would just overheat and just go nah. So this is what you end up with. The one thing. I'm going to go back because that one's slightly faster. Yeah, it's, it's quite neat. So I'm going to go to the next one, which is the same except it's slower. So a couple of things to notice. If you focus on a via as it goes around, you'll see the via turn into what it actually is, which is a little tube of copper. So if you spot a via as it's rotating, you'll see it go from a little tube to a, to a hole as it goes, goes flat. Now, uh, so one of the things I want to try and extract from this is the, is the board layer data. So you can clearly see the board layers and actually you can see them as it goes through this horizontal plane, you can really see the layers separate. And when you get it edge on, you'll get a flash and you'll actually see individual board layers. I don't know if you can see it very well on that, but over here, this is a four layer board. You can actually clearly see the individual board layers. So. I've been looking at this, I was looking at this stuff for, a, for a, a week or so when I initially did this, and it took me a week before I spotted it. Uh, so the next slide, have a look at the image and see if you can spot it yourself. Notice anything interesting about that image? As I said, it took me a week and I was, holy fuck balls, that's really cool. So I'm going to tell you that this little piece of hardware is made by a company called Gallagher. Anyone spotted it yet? Well, if you look at the top in between the board and the edge of the case, you can actually see the word Gallagher, and that's because it's laser etched onto the outside of the case, and the laser etching removes a little bit of material and therefore you can actually see it because it's slightly less dense. So it's literally GH, you can see the G-H-E-R there. You can actually read the serial number when it flips around to the other side. So this is not, so those are just pretty pictures. They are all the, those 360 degree images wrapped together, but this is what is actually happening. So you have your point source, you have your target, and you have your X-ray detector, which is basically a CCD. And for any point, so if you take a, this pixel here, 
there's a straight line between that pixel and the X-ray source. And if it just happens to pass through something, uh, so if it's going straight to this pixel, it's not passing through the object, that pixel is gonna be 100% brightness. And if it is passing through the object, depending on the density of the object, it's going to attenuate that, that light uh, and it's going to get dimmer. So you end up with a, essentially a grayscale uh, image and if there's more dense stuff in the object, you'll get darker pixels. So the C in CT scan stands for computed, commuted, computed tomography. So basically, we take all those images, uh, there are various algorithms uh, to process them, and it will essentially do ray tracing for every image. It creates this big set of uh, 3D matrices, and uh, you basically stuff all the images in, you have to calibrate it, so you have to tell it, tell it exactly how far the source is away from the detector, and, and that sort of thing, and then it will go munge, 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 and it will spit out a 3D model. And through that, so now you have a proper 3D model, and this is, this is what they use for medical diagnostics, so you can literally slice any way through that, that model. And the whole point of this is I'm slicing down horizontally through the board so that I can now only image those copper layers so I can get the copper layer on top, the copper layer on the bottom, and any other copper layers in the middle and just extract them as images rather than, than having to try and delayer the board or do all sorts of nasty stuff with chemicals to try and actually get those layers out. Uh, so that, again, provides us with the circuit diagram, which is basically the, the, the jumping off point that, that you want to jump off from uh, for any kind of hardware reverse engineering. But this has limitations. The sensor is a very small size. They're still pretty expensive. I mean, as I said, 400 bucks for that sensor was an absolute fucking steal. Uh, you s you'll see them around uh, on eBay, even used for a thousand bucks plus. So I thought my solution to actually be able to image larger devices is I'll put an XY gantry on that and I will, I'll literally move it around. So I'm taking many, many more images and stitching them together. Uh, that's gonna take a long time, but again, you know, I've taken the cost factor down by several orders of magnitude. So if I have to, you know, let it cook for 12 hours to, to get my CT scan, then so be it. It's not, it's not like I'm cooking uh, a, a human being for 12 hours under x-ray. Uh, the, the device can handle it. Uh, so big sensors, super expensive, like super expensive. Basically, imagine a, a, a single CCD that is that size. A single piece of amorphous, perfect silicon CCD. Uh, so yes, they are freaking expensive. Used 30K plus, brand new. Jesus Christ, I, I don't even want to ask. So I almost fucked this up. Because I forgot the rule. And I thought, well, the, the real solution to this is to build your own large format X-ray sensor. <laughs> and I'm like, mm, yeah, okay. And then I thought, actually, no, that's breaking the rule. It's bullshit. So if you don't have the tool, you build it. So uh, this, which I'll <laughs> pop up, uh, is a work in progress. So basically, uh, the white on the front is uh, it's called scintillation material. So it's a phosphor material that absorbs x-rays and emits photons. And it's a commoner garden uh, flatbed scanner. I think it cost about 50, 60 bucks. Uh, this phosphor material, 
So there's a couple of things I have to deal with because this is a work in progress. This particular flusmer material isn't quite bright enough and I need to do some uh, fuckery with the calibration uh, on, the, uh, on the scan head. So the, the scan head is basically a, a large linear pixel array <coughs> and uh, they use linear uh, X-ray sensors in things like uh, baggage scanners. So instead of some sort of large format detector, they have a single line of pixels covered with phosphor and they hit it with the x-rays and, and, and the belt moves forward and that's why you occasionally see them the belt will move back and forward because they're like no I, I want a better image of that part so they're running it forward at a certain speed so you get a kind of okay but lowish resolution but you can run it forward a lot slower increase the resolution so they'll occasionally do that so basically that's uh, what's called a uh, line scan x-ray and I'm like, hmm, what do I know that has a linear uh, high density image sensor? And it's like, ah. And it's got all, all the uh, mechanics in it to move it across the field of view. Uh, the uh, magnet here on the bottom is, uh, so I'm trying to not have to reverse engineer the firmware in this to, to fuck with its calibration. Uh, but also, in order to be able to detect the light from the scintillator, I can't have the internal light uh, that it uses to illuminate the page running. So there's a very simple read switch, uh, which essentially, when the read switch is close to the magnet, it's closed. So basically, when it does its calibration, which is right you know, within the first inch, uh, when you power it up, that light will come on, the device will correctly calibrate itself, but when you do a scan, that light will come on, and as soon as it moves past three quarters of an inch, it will go off, and therefore you'll actually start to see the image, uh, the X-ray image that's transmitted by the, the scintillator. Uh, as I said, that scintillation material isn't quite bright enough. There is, uh, I actually tried to solve this before I came out. There's a company called uh, Cintacore in the UK, and uh, they make scintillators. And I'm like, hmm, I wonder if I can have a sample, because there's potentially lots of useful things you can do with this. Uh, so if I can produce, uh, say, a cheap sensor uh, just with a strip on it, that's you know under a hundred quid or under a couple of hundred quid. The X-ray source here is three hundred quid. A Raspberry Pi with a screen, another hundred quid. You could end up with uh, an actual X-ray setup under five hundred bucks. Uh, and say the exposure with this panel is it's not instant because it's having to move across. Is say five to ten seconds. With us in the West, we get x-rays throughout our entire lives from, from time to time. Uh, and you've got a total accumulated dose that, that everyone's trying to keep down, but you know, it, it builds up over your lifetime. If you're in Africa or a developing country where you don't get x-rays ever, uh, even a relatively long exposure X-ray, you know, you're going to get maybe one or two in your lifetime. So, uh, you know, if this can, if I can pull this off, it actually has uh, actual medical uses. You know, a small clinic can have a basic X-ray set up for 500 quid, uh, which is low power and made of of common cheap components. And that's quite a doable thing. So uh, when I asked Cintacore for the, uh, for the pr I thought, uh, basically, I said to them, look, I probably just want uh, a strip. Uh, but with the way this calibrates, it's just easier to test it with a, a sheet. So it was like, ah, can I have a sample of a sheet of your ultra-bright scintillation material? A4 would be great. And they're like, oh, yeah, that'll be, that'll be 1,400 quid, please, plus VAT. I was like, 
nope, okay, maybe we're going with the strip after all. So when I go back, uh, we'll get the uh, ultra high bright uh, scintillator material. I'll futz with the calibration here. So under the edge, under the leading edge of the scanner is a, b a white strip. And it uses that in its calibration process to know what max white is. So if I uh, futz with the strip and, and put something that's a bit grayer in there, it's going to turn up the gain on those CCD pixels. So hopefully we'll end up with uh, a large format uh, X-ray imager for uh, under, hopefully under about 100 or 150 bucks. So I'll, uh, I'll, I'll keep you posted with that. <coughs> so we're a small company. We're, you know, poor. Uh, so if we can pull stuff off like this, what are the real bad guys doing? So you've got the, the state sponsors. You've got criminal enterprises that have surprisingly large amounts of money and are quite up for investing it in... Uh, in things that they would find useful to them. You know, if you just look at the sophistication of some ATM skimmers, you know, they are uh, quite sophisticated devices uh, that are, you know, certainly on the surface uh, of the disguises, the build quality of that stuff is, is quite high. So, again, they're going to be doing firmware extraction uh, key material extraction, again, a big thing. Where are people storing their keys? Are the keys diversified? Are they different for device? Or was the manufacturer dumb and was keying all the devices the same? And again, exploitation for APT attacks uh, or for cash or to insert stuff into the supply chain, that's happening uh, more and more frequently. So, good engineering uh, is often bad security. Good engineers try and make things easy to debug. They have a real poor understanding of silicon. They think because it's on the silicon and you've hit that lock bit, it's locked. I, I've seen instances where they've been using a module, a GSM module in this case, uh, and it's a module and it has a little tin can over it, and the manufacturer says, oh yes, if you set the lock bit, you can't read the code out. If you take the tin can off, everything is stored unencrypted on a flash chip, so you just take the tin can off, you take the flash chip off, you've got it all. Uh, so they quite often don't really understand, they read the data sheet, and that's as far as it goes. Uh, and their focus is keeping their bomb, their bill of material cost, as low as possible. So if they, if they use chip A rather than chip B and they've, they've saved uh, 0.3 of a cent, yes, that's great for them because they are you know, shipping tens of thousands of devices. Actually, the, that 0.3 of a cent could have made their device secure, but now it's insecure. And they don't really think about uh, onboard communication security. That's uh, kind of, you know, they, they think, they don't think anyone's going to be going after things on the board. And quite often, uh, they, they, they think about some stuff but not others. So I looked at an access control system that had a keypad. It had two microcontrollers in, in the keypad. One was a tiny little Linux box, which was controlling the screen and the keyboard, and that was talking to another microcontroller that was doing crypto to the back end. And it was that second microcontroller was also talking to the card reader. So I said, oh, what's going on between on that serial link between those two devices? That's all unencrypted. Yes, we know that, but you're only going to get the pin because uh, the card data is encrypted all the way through. So all, all that's going to happen, we know about it. Worst comes to worst, you're going to get the pin. It's fine. And I'm like, am I? Am I just going to get the pin? 
because everything the user types or everything the user sees is controlled by that link. You use this not just for access control, you use it for alarm systems. If I'm man in the middling that, and someone puts their pin in and says arm, my man in the middle says, yes, armed okay, everything's great, and I just don't send the arm commands to the actual system. Uh, at that point, there was a little bit shit in his pants, and uh, let's just say that link is now properly encrypted. The, uh, this particular manufacturer also, and actually one of the most secure devices I've seen, they've generally got their shit together. Uh, so they were using a hardware security module uh, to do the crypto to the back end. It uh, generated a key pair, and it was not just encrypting the data, it was encrypting and signing every single packet it sent out. And that was pretty cool. However, the problem there was they were using the same key to start up initial communications between the microcontroller and the crypto processor. And that key was common across all the devices. So that crypto processor essentially is the device identity. And it means that actually, if I desolder it from the board, it becomes a portable device identity. And I can put it on another board, which is running Evo firmware. And that swap, can, you know, I can do that swap maybe in about three or four minutes. Uh, now, again, manufacturer is pretty cool. That is all encrypted. So at the factory, when that device gets fired up, generates a random number, uh, derives a key from it, and the key for every device uh, to talk to its crypto chip is now unique. So they're they are pretty proactive and they're they're getting it. And also hardware engineers generally have a, a poor understanding of threats. They don't really think that uh, someone's actually going to dive into their hardware at a hardware level and, and hack it. Because that initial hardware hack, once you extract keys, once you extract firmware, and you give it to the software people, that opens up a whole can of whoop ass. So in general, Choose your silicon wisely. <coughs> Understand that as soon as I have your device in my hand, I've got your circuit diagrams. So all these manufacturers that go, when I say, oh, can, can I have the circuit diagram? Oh, yeah, but an attacker wouldn't have the circuit diagram. It's like, yes, you're right, they wouldn't. But it's going to take me a week to get that diagram, and I'm going to be billing you every second of it. So you can save your, yourself a lot of money and me a lot of boring pain, uh, or you, you can do it the hard way. Again, where are, the, where are the secrets kept? On a standard microcontroller, that's not good enough. If you're actually trying to protect keys, you've got to use silicon designed to protect keys. Otherwise, it's, it's going to be very rapidly game over. And don't key anything with, with common keys. Even, even though you think it's an, a good idea, actually, it can become a very, very bad idea very, very fast. It's a little bit more effort to uh, have individual keys generated at uh, first boot time, but once you do that, every one of your devices now becomes unique. And you know, as a cohort of devices, things are quite secure. And again, don't be ruled by your bomb costs. It's OK to, to throw an extra 10 or 20 cents at something if all of a sudden your device is now going to be secure because of that. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to say thank you to Mr. Bott. So when I was having, I didn't think dealing with a stepper controller, I thought that was the, la the least of my worries. It was a pain in the arse. Uh, Mr. Bott sorted out plan B. And John McMasters uh, wrote the open source driver for the Gendex and Dexis uh, dental x-ray uh, detector heads. 
Uh, it's all written in Python. It works an absolute treat. And uh, as I said, you know, fast enough, the whole thing's running on a Raspberry Pi. So uh, thank you very much.